a huge honor today for me to be podcast interviewing Greg Beck with InOfficeDentalPlans.com. Greg is president of Dental Practice Services, Inc. in Overland Park, Kansas, and the program manager of the private dental plan program. DPS has operated the PDP program since 2002 and works with other dental consultants to promote the concept of a self-administered plan. So what? So first of all, how did you get into this? How does it work? Uh, you know, what? what How's it going? Well, thank you, Howard, very much. Um, I was, uh, I had to go through the claims processing method with a third party administrator, with a major carrier. And it was frustrating to say the least. And uh, I hear where it's frustrating for offices, but it's also frustrating for patients. And uh, my wife, Linda, needed a couple of crowns and uh, the doctor's diagnosis said that it was needed uh, the tooth was cracked and uh, both of them need to be replaced and it was the appropriate care uh, we submitted for an approval obtained that uh, had the service done and submitted the claim and it was promptly rejected and uh, learned many things going through the process. Uh, the first thing I learned is that the dental office doesn't have any influence be for the patient and the carrier. It's, it's a plan between the patient and the carrier. Second thing is that uh, the doctor's diagnosis is not the determining factor. It's the insurance companies. Uh, review that is the determining factor. So, uh, needless to say, it was frustrating. It was easy for me to see from the outside if you could eliminate claims processing and use that um, as a means for the dental office to provide the service. We found out there is absolutely no value to claims processing. So, so how does this actually work? So, so what is the market for this? Um, how does it work? How many dental offices are, do you have currently doing it? Well, we have quite a few offices that are doing it themselves. Uh, the important aspect is that it is a direct contract between the patient and the dental office. It's merely a, an alternate payment arrangement. And uh, it is you find that a lot of people like myself who are self-employed, uh, uh, people who are contractors, there's a lot of people who um, are not, don't have an employee-employer relationship, they have, they're a contractor, and so it's ideal for them. But it's for the patient who does not need a network, uh, who likes their dentist and wants to maintain uh, with their dentist, and for those that uh, want to be able to take care of their oral care, it's uh, very important for those people so that they can use the plan and be encouraged to use the plan as opposed to not using it. So is it really kind of a, uh, a financial arrangement then? I mean, does it really come down to being like uh, making payments? Uh, technically, yes. But we do incorporate some concepts that are very beneficial for the office. Uh, we can calculate utilization on a plan. And we know about how much a plan is going to be used. And even though you encourage patients to use it, not everybody will. And so you uh, can calculate it and price it so it is beneficial for the, for the patient but also uh, beneficial for the office because you don't have to calculate claims processing in it. So, so why should a dental office do this? Well, uh, we surveyed many of our offices we, uh, in various locations around the country. And the number one reason offices like it is treatment acceptance is very, very high. Uh, in a survey with office managers, about 70 to 80 percent of the people accept treatment if they don't have options and uh, they do want to have a plan. What's important about it is there's two things that uh, patients like. 
number one, they feel that the office is trying to help them. Secondly, the, uh, they have a trust factor with the office. There's not that much trust between a third party administrator. And so there's that trust factor. And so what we find is patients do accept the treatment and then they stay with the practice. They, they aren't out shopping around. That they really like the way the plan works. And you've been doing this since 2002? Yes, yes. How, so, how, many, how many dental offices have you signed up for that, roughly? Well, we've got quite a few offices around the uh, uh, Kansas, Missouri area. We're also located on the, uh, the East Coast, uh, Texas, Colorado, Florida. And we're always adding offices, uh, working with an office in uh, Houston area as well as in the um, Sarasota area, Florida. So, so we have quite a few offices. So, so talk the nitty gritty details. Right now you're talking to dentists, they're driving to work, they're listening to you on iTunes. How do they set this up and what kind of an impact do you think it'll have on their practice? How much does it cost? T talk, talk about the details. Okay, uh, what we do is uh, there's four things that DPS does. Uh, we, we will set up a customized plan. And that's, a, that's an important aspect because an office that is located in, say, a rural area has a different need than an office that's in the metropolitan area. And uh, consequently, if, one, if an office is located in the suburbs versus, say, in a downtown area. So the needs are different. So we set up a customized plan. We'll actuarially calculate it on what the fees need to be for the office. And so we'll set that plan up. We train the staff. We can either train the staff um, in person at the office or do it remotely. We also uh, will provide uh, material for them, their brochures and applications and all of their marketing material for them. And then uh, the important thing that uh, offices really like what we do is uh, we take care of the monthly collections and the reporting form. And that's an important aspect. Uh, what sets us apart is uh, patients can pay monthly. Uh, with a lot of offices, if they have a, a self-serve or self-administered plan, uh, they only offer annual payments by the patient. Under the private dental plan, patients can pay monthly, we take care of that, and we provide all the reports to the office. And the nice thing is, it's not a dashboard where uh, uh, an office manager has to remember to go to and, and get their reports, we send them to them. We send it to them and we assign a, an account manager so that the staff has someone to work with. You know your uh, your uh, biggest claim to fame. What's that? Is you got my uh, most famous, uh, my most favorite person in dental school, Lisa Gonzalez, is a uh, user of your plan. We both graduated from UMKC in '87, and she said, "I wanted to let other doctors know how well the private dental plan program works for me. I do not take any dental plans, and participate in only two insurance plans besides this." Uh, PDP program works well for me because of the high monthly income and ease of the administration of it. My plan works well for patients who are not eligible for insurance and help sell our treatment plans. The program is financially beneficial to both the patient or office. I would highly recommend the dental practice services and the DDP program to any dental office and each should take a serious look at our alliance. Our alliance of dentists now has a way to compete against the insurance companies. I thought Lisa Gonzalez was the nicest, smartest, sweetest, rock solid, down to earth person in my class. And you won her over in uh, spades. Do you know Lisa? Oh, yes, very much so. And uh, um, our, our boys actually played basketball uh, with each other. So, hey, you know uh, what? You know what would be good for on you know, different teams, but uh, they were in the same. You, but, you know uh, what would be good for uh, this uh, um, podcast? Uh, because I know my homies, and their homies saying, okay, well, you're, you're selling something, but. Lisa's a dentist and she's buying it. You should get Lisa to podcast me for the second half of this and tell him how she uses your plan in the office. I think that'd be a hell of a uh, more value added thing. 
Well, I will arrange that. Uh, there's quite a few uh, local dentists here that know you. Uh, we have a great working relationship with Dr. Gonzalez and the staff. And uh, um, it's uh, her endorsement is has been very important to us. Yeah, have and her have her uh, um, have her uh, uh, Skype me uh, for uh, uh, we'll either tack it on or, or release them you one day and at least the next because. Uh, Lisa's an, am an amazing role model. I think every uh, every young dentist should listen to uh, Lisa. Yes, and um, their staff works with it extensively. She is she is actually one of the original people. Okay, uh, but th this is dentistry uncensored. So talk more nitty gritty. They're all driving their cars, saying, "Greg, what does this cost?" Well, the the cost varies depending on uh, different area. Um, where the office is located and where uh, the uh, where the office is located and how much of the services uh, that they want uh, for an office what we do charge is uh, six dollars per unit per month and uh, as somebody signs up with a plan they use that in order we actuarially calculate that fee into as they have patients sign up on their plan. And what that does is it pays for the ongoing service, pays for the collection services and the reporting services, and also the uh, situational uh, services. We end up, you know, for example, people will need uh, special collections and we perform those and we don't charge for that. That's all inclusive of the fee structure that is put there. Okay, some and people so, might not understand $6 per unit per month. What, what is $6 per unit? Per claim? Per, per procedure? Uh, so when you have someone sign up, they can sign up either as a single, a couple, or a family. And so you have a certain rate for a single that can vary anywhere from the mid-20s to the mid-40s. Or have couple coverage that can average anywhere from the mid 50s to the mid 70s depending on the plan structure is that per month or per year per month okay per month um, and so what we do is and then for a family coverage uh, depending on the plan structure it's from the mid 70s to a uh, little over a hundred dollars and is that and dependent on so, the number of children they have exactly we calculate on our structures, a family of four. So that's a husband, wife, and two children. But and if you had three children, the plan would cost more, or four children, it costs yes, more? Yes, uh, there's usually a per unit charge. Uh, for uh, Usually it's around 15 to $20 per child per month if an additional child is part of that. Well, that's just one more reason to have a vasectomy or a tubal ligation while you're still <laughs> in dental school. Right, well, Ryan? Uh, uh, from the actuary tables, uh, we used to calculate a family size of 3.7, and we've actually dropped it to 3.4 now. Well, so it, you drop, say those two numbers again, you dropped it from 3.4 to oh, 2. Well, it's just uh, for calculating family sizes. The, you're and, saying the average family used to be 3.4, now it's 2.7? No, it used to be 3.7, and now it's 3.4. Over what time period? Uh, 14 years. So 14 years ago, uh, the actuary tables were 3.7 for the size of the family or the number of kids? Uh, average size of family. And now it's down to 2.4 uh, or 3.4? Well, 2.4 is what we calculate per unit. But 14 That's years ago, it was 3.7? Yes. Wow. Wow. That is so, amazing. So family sizes are starting to get smaller. That's basically it. Well, family actually, size. actually, when you go around the world, there's uh, about 210 countries. And uh, basically, when you get 80% of your girls to graduate from high school and 40% of the girls to have some college, you actually, your population starts contracting. So there's 20 countries um, like, like you take Germany and France and England, all those European countries, if you backed out immigration, they'd have less people every year. Japan doesn't get any immigration. So the island of Japan gets less people every single day. It's just shrinking. So uh, they actually have already calculated how long it will take to get 
uh, third world countries up to the, their public schools and colleges built up. And so we're at 7 billion people now. They're thinking it'll max at 13 to 15. And then 500 years from now, we'll have less people than there was uh, 1,000 AD when uh, uh, the Vikings were sailing around. So, so yeah, when, when girls get uh, educated, they start realizing that a child is a luxury item and you have to pick, do you want a baby or do you want a car? Do you want another right. children or do you want to go to Disneyland? And they start, right. and, and when they don't have education, they start having them at 16. And if they have some college, they start having them at 26. And uh, uh, Japan is, is amazing. And now there's three countries, including Russia, that give you a tax, uh, that give you a monetary payment, like we do with Social Security, right. that will give you a monetary payment. Japan, Russia, and another country, if a girl has a baby, she will get a monthly check from the government until that baby's 21 years old. Oh, to encourage. Uh, in yeah, yeah, to have more babies. How many did Lisa have? Uh, on the plane, she's got over 100 uh, no, units. No, no, uh, how many uh, babies did she end up having? I don't know. I know her one son plays basketball in college. Well, you'll so, have to get her on and tell me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, uh, so, a, so you, so this is, do you, um, if some dental office signs up for this, um, how significant of an impact is, is their practice? I mean, you think it's going to grow at 1%, 3%, 5%? I mean, how, 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 what, what kind of, uh, impact does this have on an office? I think, uh, the growth will be double digit and that's what we see. And the, the other aspect that's important is retention. That's what we see with this. We have an office that signed up uh, 125 patients. And when I say patient, I mean single couple or family. There may be more, you know, there's more patients involved with a family versus a single. But uh, we have an office that signed up 125 patient units in one year. And of the second year, 120 of those renewed their plan. So what you're seeing is as you add patients to the plan, you retain them for much, much longer. Um, on average, approximately 40% of the people will keep the plan four years and longer. And of that 40%, 25% keep it six years or longer. And so the retention of a patient staying on a plan uh, is very, very high with a private dental plan because there is that trust between the office and the patient. Now, it's, a, it's amazing we're in an industry where all the dentists have an advertising budget and they're all going to spend one, two, three percent. Every practice I know that's in the uh, two to four million dollar year range will spend five to seven percent on advertising uh they always want those new patients but then when you try to pitch them a patient loyalty program uh to keep your patients for life uh like like maybe uh, give them a better shot like by using the wand they they, they balk at spending three thousand bucks at a wand to give a painless injection but they don't blink at spending three thousand dollars on a direct mail campaign to every house in their neighborhood and um i think this falls actually under finance, treatment planning, and uh, treatment plan presentation, uh, and also patient loyalty programs. But where I've seen it work significantly is, is when it, the, the people that don't have insurance, and what, what percent of Americans do you say have no dental insurance? Do you, do you have any numbers on that? Well, I have heard up to 48%. Okay, so... so That's so, the figure I've had. So probably 48%, so basically half of America doesn't have dental insurance, but when you go to the dental office, it's about three fourths due because the ones that have a subsidy or a plan are more likely to go to the dentist than the ones that are cash only. But when those say, say it's one in four of your patients come in and they have no insurance. I've right. seen this work the most where you say, uh, well, here's the fees. And let's just say it's a thousand bucks for a crown. But if you sign up for this insurance, we have in office insurance. And if you sign up for this plan, instead of the crown being a thousand dollars, now the crown's only nine hundred dollars or eight fifty. Is do you, do you see this also? Right. Yeah, and, and it's a huge, huge closer in my office and many other offices. It is a huge closure to to have that because what we find is patients are thankful 
having a, a program like this. And uh, one of our, our offices, who is a, a client of ours, uh, you know of uh, Keith and Wilson. Uh, you probably, uh, I work with uh, Bill, and what he found out is, is that the loyalty goes up tremendously because their patients are very savvy. And uh, they understand it when you explain, you know, the cost and operation of a third-party administered plan versus an in-house private dental plan. Patients understand that. And so they do stay with the office because they look like the, the office is trying to help them. And they'll get the treatment that they want. Every single office I hear is the first reason they like it is treatment acceptance and it builds the patient loyalty with that do you know uh do you know dennis myers yes he is a uh, uh he is a client of ours right and he's in saint joe missouri yes i'm yes. lecturing there uh september 16th uh my my uh, classmate uh, george Rui invited me to speak to his group uh if you're in the area that might be good to sit down with uh uh, at the at the lunch hour at the end of the seminar, and we could film a podcast with uh, Dennis Myers and yourself uh, talking about that because I know my homies, and every <laughs> time I've surveyed these guys since 1998, I'll say, uh, if a dental company says this, do you believe them? And it's about consistently about 10%. It's actually like 9 to 8. But if they get on Dental Town and a dentist tells them, the believability is about 92%. That's why our Townie okay. Choice Award is so um, important every year because all the companies say, you know, our product is all that and a bag of chips. And they're like, well, right. you, well yeah, you say that. You're selling it. But then when <laughs> several thousand dentists vote, and voting is right now, and uh, we've already got half the votes in, when, the, when we go through every category of bleaching, bonding, veneers, burrs, everything, and have the Townies uh, vote, I mean, everybody reads that. It's so powerful. And then we also show the math because a lot of products, it's really not fair they're a winner because in some products, like, like let's say loops, uh, the winner is like 51% and the loser is like 49%. So the dentist can see the votes cast. So they can sit there and say, oh, the one I'm using is number two by 2%. Uh, but sometimes you look at these uh, Townie Choice Awards and you say, um, and you know, I always tell people, you know, just if it, if it works, you know, you, you got enough problems on your head to change something that works. I think dentists are very brand loyal because they're always trying to fix what's broke and nobody wants to fix what's not broke. So if your impression material, your endo files, if something's working, that's the least of your problems. But like say it's a denture reline material and you just hate yours. And then you get on the Tony Choice Award and realize that yours came in eighth place and only 2% of the dentists voted for that. And then you look at the top and say, oh, man, the winner got 39% of all the votes. I'm going to try that product. So they're very brand loyal. So if you're in, uh, if you're in uh, uh, St. Joe on uh, Friday, September 16th, uh, you might uh, have uh, Dennis D. Myers, if he's uh, going to my seminar with George Rui. Uh, okay. George Rui is the one throwing the uh, – it's the, uh, it's the uh, St. Joe – uh, what what is it called? I forgot. It's the St. Joe Dental Society Dental City Club. Something. Okay. And uh, that's about a what an hour and a half drive north of you. It's very simple to get there. Yeah. And I will definitely be there, and I will dot uh, contact Dr. Meyer. He actually and, and maybe maybe uh if it, maybe Lisa might go to that. Well, uh, absolutely. I will contact both of them. If Lisa if Lisa went to that. Because she, she loves my, uh, my roommate, uh, George Rui. We're all buddies together. And uh, we could actually set up a round table. We could have Lisa. And, you know, we, we, we could all sit around the table and talk about this. Because uh, the reason I want you on the show is, is, again, and here's the other thing that, I, um, that dentists don't get. So if you ask a dentist, how much do you get for a root canal? They say 1000 bucks. I say, okay, now let's go look at your data. Okay, 82% of your patients... Or on inch on a PPO, and you signed up for this PPO, and they're paying you six hundred to eight hundred dollars. So, so this thousand dollar root canal fee is adjusted down um, right. four out of you know eighty percent of the time. And then I asked the dentist, 
well, what percent of your practice do you want to grow? And they go, I want to grow the cash practice. I'm sick of insurance. And I say, okay, so then if you want more of something, subsidize it. And if you want it to go away, tax it, okay? Make it more expensive. And then, and then I say, okay, so you want to grow the cash practice. I say, well, how much is a root canal? And you tell me a thousand bucks. And they say, okay, and they hang up and they call nine other dentists and they're all competing on price. It's weird that you tell everybody your crown is a thousand bucks when 82% of your crowns are on a PPO fee that's 200 lower. But then when that cash patient calls up and you say, well, the crown's a thousand bucks, but you know, if you don't have dental insurance, we actually do have dental insurance that you can buy for the individual. And if you bought this dental insurance, then your crown would be this lower fee. And that just perks up their ears and that, that's a closer. It's a right. real closer. Well, the, the um couple of things that's important about this is since this is not insurance, there is no UCR. The structure you use is the private fee, the published fee that the office has. So they're basing it on that, not some discounted uh, UCR that an insurance company has. Secondly, if you have an office that refers a patient to an insurance company in order to encourage them to accept the treatment, there is no benefit for the office. That's actually, you know, more detrimental for the office and the patient also than it is referring them to their own private dental plan. Well, I'll get technical because when you said um, UCR, because it's not insurance, I would like to argue that there's no such thing as dental insurance to begin with. I mean, insurance, right. uh, so it's, it, that's a regulatory term uh, for your state, federal laws, whatever, but there's no insurance. Insurance is when you spread the risk around a lot of people paying a little when a few make a claim, like everybody has fire insurance and almost no one has a house burned down. I've lived in Ahwatukee for 30 years. I've only seen one house burned down in 30 years. Um, car insurance, everybody has car insurance. And, and when I'm lecturing in a room, I'll say, how many of you have totaled your car this year? And like one hand goes up. And, uh, but dental is a benefit because there's nowhere to spread the risk. I mean, if you insure 100 people for dental, uh, they all don't floss. They all need a cleaning. They all need a recall. Uh, you know, the, 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 there's no one to spread the risk around. So dental is only a benefit if you can get your employer or your government to pay for it. So if the right. government provides Medicaid, or your employer bought a dental, it's a dental benefit. That, that's all it is, it's a benefit. But they, they actually think it's an insurance. And healthcare, amazingly, one of the reasons the cost is completely out of control is 80% of health insurance, which is crazy premiums, is not even insurance. It's just normal stuff. I'm fat, I'm going in, I'm getting weighed, blood pressure, diabetes, all this chronic stuff. Very few of it is, oh, my kid just got cancer and dad just dropped of a heart attack that the insurance uh, part of healthcare for, or what I'd call catastrophic is very, very small. It's just all this routine noise. And so they, uh, they, they think there's such thing as insurance, but it's really a benefit. And this is really a plan. This is a, a discount. This is an in-office discount plan. It, it is, it is. And, and, and I think it falls more under patient loyalty. It's great perceived value. They sign up for this thing. Now, are they, are they, putting this on a monthly charge to their credit card? They can uh, use their checking account, savings account, credit card, uh, debit card, or even their HSA. And what, uh, what percent are checking versus savings versus credit card? I would say uh, between 90 and 95% are checking accounts. 90 to 95 percent are checking yep. account oh my god i am so wrong i would have just bet my car you were going to say credit card right what's uh what's nice about the the private dental plan is we do calculate utilization in it and there's two things we know the longer that somebody is on the their plan utilization goes down because they get their service and it goes down over time. The other thing that we know is the, large, the more number of people that you put on your private dental plan, 
utilization goes down. Now what we see with today's dental insurance from a patient's perspective is that the cost of dental insurance goes up every year. It goes up no matter what. What we find out with the private dental plan is as an office sets it up, utilization goes down over time so they don't have to raise rates on their plan on a regular basis. So if someone who signs up on their plan, they're paying the same amount, you know, four years from now than they are now. And it creates much more uh, loyalty, but it's also good for the office because they know utilization does go down as patients take care of their teeth, take care of their oral health care, and get the service they need. Um, with every dentist that I talk to, they would rather work on a mouth with someone who takes care of their oral health care than ones that do not, they don't ever visit, and then come in when there's a problem. Nice. But again, I think this is a uh, patient loyalty because number one, the dentist is always spending, you know, like 3% on, on advertising. And then I go to the dentist, I say, okay, if your hygienist worked 40 hours a week and she worked 50 weeks a year, that's 2000 hours. So a hygienist could only see a thousand people twice a year. Now everyone gets 10 new patients a month. Well, at 10 new patients a month, Every eight years, you would have another thousand, so you'd have another full-time hygienist. But you go into any dental office with a full-time hygienist and come back in eight years, now they don't have two full-time hygienists. If you were getting 20 new patients a month, every four years, you would add another full-time hygienist. There's offices in Kansas City that have been getting 30, 40 new patients a month for 20, 30, 40 years, and they have one hygienist that works four days a week. So they're always used to doing all these advertising, marketing, and now everybody wants to jump on social media. They think they're going to build their practice with Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and LinkedIn and Snapchat. When the real winners, when I go find the office that's doing a million dollars, they're crushing it, they're keeping customers longer. And when you said that this, if they're on this plan, that in four years, 40% are still on it. In six years, 25% of your patients are still coming into your practice. And dentists need to switch from this new patient drug. I, th I think it's almost like a heroin addiction. They get, <laughs> they get addicted to advertising and they don't keep any of their customers alive. I mean, I can, I can show you 70 year old dentists that are emailing me and saying, what do you, how, what do you recommend for new patients? I'm like, dude, you've been in a town of 10,000 for 40 years. Why do, why do you need to advertise in a town of 10,000 when you've been there for four decades. And, and then they don't want to address, well, the shots hurt. Well, you didn't take my insurance. Well, you didn't have nitrous oxide. You weren't open early, early mornings, evenings, weekends. Uh, you know, they just all, you know, you can sit there and ask every single person going out the back door, or you can ask them when they come in the front door. You can just sit there and say, hey, Greg, back. Why did you leave your last dental office? Well, I can't leave my office Monday through Friday eight to five, and that was the only hours he had. And I found a dentist that was open at seven, or stayed open right. till seven, or did every other Saturday for four hours. Well, our dental office just got Blue Cross and Blue Shield. He didn't take it. You know, I have anxiety. I wanted to go somewhere where they could knock me out, or give me laughing gas, or give me Ativan or Halcyon. I mean, there's just all these reasons why they don't come back. And if you would uh, focus on those. Uh, it'd be a hell of a lot easier to build a rocking hot business. Right. You know, we I've talked with a few offices, and it's very interesting because the private dental a private dental plan is very much a novel novelty. And I was actually in an office. It was in the the Baltimore area, and uh, was getting ready to implement a plan and train the staff and and give a presentation. And there was a young gentleman there in the waiting area. And I asked him, he was looking at a brochure of their plan. And I asked him, I said, uh, so uh, what service are you coming in for? And, and uh, how did you choose uh, your doctor? And he, he told me, he says, well, I have insurance uh, through my uh, employer. And uh, I told him, I said, well, this plan probably isn't for you. Um, I said, you're... Uh, your employer will contribute uh, to your plan. And I said, this is really for people who don't have insurance 
or have to buy it individually. And what he said to me, he goes, yeah, I know that, but I'm taking this home to my parents. They could use this. And sure enough, he gave it to them. They were at another office and they came to this office, signed up on the plan, and now you have a, a new practice patient that's formed. I and you hear that office, uh, you know, you know, office after office. It, it provides a novelty for them in order to help build their uh, patient base, but retain them much, much longer. I'll tell you another interesting benefit or what I like to call is financing the invisible. Uh, when you buy a car from General Motors, General Motors doesn't make a car. They assemble 30,000 parts and build a car. I mean, they, they don't make mufflers and tires. They, they assemble a car. So they have to sell it to you because they need their 30 grand because they just bought a bunch of parts and a bunch of people and they need their bills. So they have to finance. There's financing something real. It's a product. It's, it's, it's a car. It's a house. It's an iPhone. But the craziest one is financing orthodontics. You know, they, uh, they say, well, the braces are 6000 bucks, and you'll need to give us $1,500 down, and then we'll finance the rest at 10% interest. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you financing? When you go in to get braces, you need a Pano and a Ceph. That's 2 bucks. They need brackets. That's 100 bucks. So you're only incurring cost when this little child comes in every month for the next two years. And it was Orthodontic Centers of America. Are you old enough to remember Orthodontic Centers of America? Were you in dentistry back in that day? I mean, that was... Well, uh, I, am not, I am old enough probably for it. However, I don't remember it. <laughs> okay, because you, you've only been in dentistry since 2002. So this, right. was, this was before that. And so Orthodontic Centers of America had this genius named Lazarus in New Orleans, and he said, what are we financing? I mean, you wouldn't go in to get your Manny Petty, and the Manny Petty lady wouldn't say, well, I'm going to sell you a program for two years of Manny Petties, and I need, you know, 500 down, and then I'm going to finance and, and charge interest for the back half, because she only incurs cost when you come in for your Manny Petty. You only incur costs as an orthodontist when that child comes in. I mean, I mean, when you're when you get fifteen hundred dollars down payment, are you prepaying your rent? Are you prepaying your labor, your electric, your supplies? It didn't make any sense. So Lazarus came out and said, "You know what? With Orthodontic Centers of America, we'll finance everyone zero interest, zero down, one hundred ninety nine dollars a month for thirty months, no questions asked." And all these people who couldn't jump over the economic barrier to entry of giving the orthodontist. $1,500 down, they all ran to Orthodontic Centers of America. But the other orthodontists couldn't compete because the way they had grown their business, they needed those 15 down payments each month to pay their bills. They couldn't survive the decreased cash flow to compete with Orthodontic Centers of America and say, okay, it's get, this is going to be a short-term lull because I'm not going to be getting the $1,500 down payment, but it's going to massively increase the close rate because now I'm financing it at 0% interest, 0% down, $200 a month. And, and I'm always shocked at how many orthodontists around the world, especially in poor areas, did not learn the lesson from Orthodontic Centers of America that was the only dental services organization that ever in history made it to the New York Stock Exchange and reached a billion dollar valuation before it imploded, uh, like uh, most of these... Uh, big corporates do because you're not going to get 12 dentists to agree that today is Wednesday, uh, let alone on how to treat someone <laughs> for orthodontics. I mean, the, the doctors are doctors and doctors just can't agree on anything. So the bottom line is, so there, there's a, there's an example of where we finance stuff in dentistry. You don't finance a service. I mean, it, it, just, it makes no sense. No, no one finances haircuts, massages, mani pedis but leave it to dentists to finance orthodontics when uh, there's, uh, they only incur their cost when that patient comes in. And then, and then that unit of time in the office is that unit of time for labor, rent, mortgage, equipment, build out lab bills, Invisalign trays, whatever the heck. So, so yeah, this is a lot of it's uh, smoke and mirrors. I mean, we're, but orthodontists are financing ortho when there's no apparent reason. And people go to their work and they say, oh, they got insurance. Well, it's not insurance. It's a benefit. It's a benefit. The, 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 the only thing you're getting is your employers chipping in 
on you not brushing and flossing your teeth and having nine cavities. He's right. just helping you. It's a, it's a benefit. There's no actuarial risk analysis versus moral hazard like there is with auto and fire on your house. I mean, it, it's a benefit. And, and I uh, wanted you on this program today because um, a lot of, uh, you know, when you go to Singapore and China and Russia and Brazil, there's no such thing as dental insurance. It doesn't exist. And they buy their dentistry just like you would buy your iPhone and your Nike shoes and your bicycle and your trip to Disneyland. But when you cross the ocean into Tokyo, now everyone in Japan thinks that the government should pay for their teeth. And they all just, you know, come in and, and you tell them the tree plan. They just, well, just do whatever the Japanese dental insurance says. And in America, America is one of those countries, the richest country in the world, where they buy their own car, their own house, their own iPhone, their own bicycle, their own motorcycle. They buy their own jet ski. No problem with that. But when it comes to their human body, oh, well, that's not my responsibility. I mean, someone else should pay for the fact. That's the important part you should take care of. I know it's the most it's the most perverse incentive in the world. In fact, when people talk about dental insurance, the first thing I think is, uh, gosh, if there was no dental insurance for the poor, there was none, wouldn't that eventually treat the society to realize maybe we do need to brush and floss? Exactly. But for the last well, couple of days, every newspaper is running articles that there's no research on floss. So if your dentist tells you to floss, you don't floss, don't feel guilty because... <laughs> There's no proof because they don't realize there's no proof because that would be about a $10 million study and you'd have to talk in half the people not to floss. <laughs> right. Well, and, you know, I like one of the reasons that, that I like the program. And like I said, I represent the patient. I, I don't. Uh, yes, I do work with dental offices. But I look at it from a patient's perspective. And the one thing I like about the program is patients are encouraged to use it. When you have an, a, an insurance plan from a third party administrator, they benefit by you not using it. And, uh, and so with this, they do encourage it. And what we hear from offices is that patients that are on a private dental plan tend to keep their appointments all the time. Now that they know that they can get their treatment or their their uh, cleanings, exams, and x-rays, their routine services, that it's not out of pocket, they will end up going to their appointments rather than postponing it, saying, well, I, I can't, you know, the, the tire got was flat this, this month, so I had to pay for my tire, you know, pay for a new tire. And so forth. So uh, you know, we're really. I feel like we're we're helping society because we are helping a segment be able to take care of their care. And and uh, you know, with a private dental plan, yes, it is for people who don't have insurance. Yes, but for those who who buy it individually. Um, can find out that they can get a better deal with something like this since uh, they are paying for a service that they really aren't getting a benefit for. Well, you know, it's uh, like I say, we've got to stop using the word insurance and dentistry because there's, right. there's no form. It's a dental benefit. So it's for people that don't have a dental benefit being paid by the government or the employer. But humans are emotional and they make very irrational decisions. And I, you see it all the time. There, there's a couple of businesses out in my backyard that have had a going out of business cell once a year uh, for 30 years. And, and they, when people <laughs> drive by and see they're going out of business, they run in there and buy stuff. Um, you know, you always have these 4th of July sales and Labor Day sales. And, right. and, and a hundred percent of all car lots, you can get the same 4th of July price the day after 4th of July. Um, right. But, but it, whatever it takes the monkey to get motivated to close and say, okay, I'm going to do this. And like I say, when, um, what I'm trying to tell my homies that when, you know, if you're trying to build your cash practice and you're getting phone shoppers, you need to track that. How many people call your office a day right. and ask for a price? And what are they asking the price on? Is it a crown? Is it a root canal? Is it an extraction? Is it a denture? And sometimes it's a denture and your own receptionist saying, well, Greg doesn't do dentures. And so you need to track. It's called getting to yes. So whenever you're telling a patient data, that's why I like recorded phone calls. 
So there's lots of companies that will record all your phone calls and then they'll, they'll speed through them and give you feedback and say, okay, you're having like 19 callers a month asking for a price of a crown and you're saying a thousand and they hang up, but in your own office, you're doing 82% of your crowns on a PPO schedule that's, that's less than 800. And then you tell me you want to grow your cash practice. So let's get a dental, an in-office dental insurance plan and then let's try a different clothes. They say, how much is a crown? You say, well, a crown is $1,000, but we do sell a dental insurance plan, even though it's a dental benefit. We do sell a dental benefit plan. And if, is this just for you or you and your husband or you and your kids? You know, if it's just for you, it's $27 a month. And then instead of that crown being $1,000, the crown would only be, and then you decide what the price is. And what I think the price should be is, is what you're doing 80% of your crowns for anyway. I mean, if you're, if you're willing to do 80% of your crowns for this PPO fee, then offer that to the cash patient right. and, uh, and then build your cash, uh, your cash business. We always work with uh, offices and uh, assigning new or bringing in new patients is important, but being able to retain them is just as important. And when people do call into an office, they do always ask pricing. And the other thing too is they always ask is, what insurances do you take? And I always try to have office staff tell them, we take many. However, we've got our own in-office private dental plan, and we have them use the term private dental plan and, uh, and say operates uh, just like insurance. However, there is no third-party administrator with it, and that catches the patient's ear. And when you can do that, they start listening and the idea is to get that patient into the door and when you can offer more uh, it works much much better and see they'll they'll upgrade a uh, hundred thousand dollars to get a 3d x-ray machine but they don't even have a digital phone system like i'll say well how many incoming calls do you have a month no idea oh i did this marketing program it was great okay well how many incoming uh calls did you have last year this exact month versus this year with that $10,000 flyer you mailed out. They have no idea. Uh, they don't measure it. Then I'll ask them the close rate. I know the close rate for the country. The country is when a dentist tells, uh, diagnoses 100 cavities, only 38 get drilled, filled, and billed. And then you sit there and say, well, what is your close rate? They've never even ran the report. I say, well, you've been on Dentrix for 20 years. Go to Dentrix and run a report telling me what percent of the dentistry treated, diagnosed, and treatment plan is, is completed, no idea. And then you say, okay, well, if you got this, if, if you do this for a month, try an in-office dental insurance plan for a month. What does that do to your close rate? Well, hell, they wouldn't know what their close rate was last month. If they did this for a month, they wouldn't even know afterward. They, they only have gut feelings. They always say, well, I've got a gut feeling that worked. I say, well, guts are filled with fecal matter. You have a <laughs> shitty opinion. You have no data. You're a talking monkey. You're the only animal at the zoo with clothes on. So oh, yeah. uh, get data driven, start measuring. And dental and offices, you know, it was the scheduling institute figured this out 15 years ago. They they go start tracking an office. They'd find out that four incoming strange numbers that were not in the dentist practice management information system, a Dentrix, EagleSoft, whatever. It'd take like four incoming calls to get one person scheduled in the seat. And it was, uh, it was a scheduling institute that said, and thought, what if we could build a business to train the receptionist to get that from four to one to just three to one? I mean, just do the math on three to one. And you just took an office doing $700,000 a year, and now it's a million-dollar practice. And some of these guys got to two to one. One of my friends, Tom Adderon, was huge into this, and it took him four years to convince me to try, and it was, it was, it was a cash cow. So, yeah, so less advertising, more patient loyalty. Uh, less learning how to do crazy dental procedures and buying an $80,000 laser to do a phrenectomy that you didn't even do one last year or going to these veneer courses when right now it's August 10th and 90% of you haven't even done one single veneer case, yet you're going to go spend $5,000 this weekend learning how to do veneers and start looking at how many phone calls, how many new numbers have to call in your office before your receptionist closes one and gets a butt in the chair. And what if this dental insurance plan 
changed your close rate? What if her offering this changed four incoming strangers to one scheduled patient to three? That's several hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, the, the payback period is, is phenomenal. We did some actual hard dollar calculations with a couple of offices who have been using the plan for years. And the numbers were, were so phenomenal, I didn't believe any, I don't think anybody would believe me. You know how you said, if a dentist tells someone, then they're going to believe it. And if I say it, nobody's going to believe it. And so we find out that uh, the amount that is made is considerable. And it is dependent upon how efficient the office is and, and how good of a close rate the staff is. And the beauty about the private dental plan, and we did this on purpose, is that it is simple. The one thing about uh, today's dental insurance, and I know you don't like to hear that, but in insurance, they complicate it so much. You don't know what's covered. You don't know what the fee structure is. I had a situation myself where um, I got a, a fluoride uh, wash, and I thought it was covered, found out it wasn't, and got a bill for it. And what we do is we set up an operations manual just like this for every office lists every service lists it and you know what the cost is and you know what is covered and what isn't very simple straightforward and if a doctor wants to offer more he certainly can and offer other incentives but uh, the patient loyalty on a private plan is phenomenal Nice. Uh, um, so you think you're going to be in uh, St. Joe, Missouri? I know I will. You're going to get. Are you going to talk to those two dentists? See if they uh, want to do a round table. Yes. Yes. Um, and if they don't have a room there, I will find a bar where we can all sit at the bar, <laughs> and we'll get a big bowl I, of peanuts, and we'll just I, have a. I, uh, I talk better when I have a beer in my hand. So. Well, uh, uh, congratulations. I mean, you've been doing this from 2002 to 2016. I mean, 14 years. Right. Uh, that's amazing. I, I, I was laughing when we were talking about uh, the close rate, and I'm just thinking, how many dentists walked out of school and don't even know what a close is? I mean, I, you know, I'm in dental offices all the time, and you'll just hear dentists just talking and talking about the treatment and a root canal and the root canal, and the patient's not even looking. Hell, they're surfing on Facebook. And, and this guy never even went in for the clothes. I right. mean, I mean, if, if, if I went to a gastroenterologist and he told me that, you know, he, he put the camera up my yin yang and found a green golf ball and it needs to come out. I'm like, I get it. I, I don't need to see uh, right. videos of it. I don't need a scratch and smell poster. I don't I don't need to talk about some polyp in my butt for 30, 40 minutes. It's like, OK, I got it. What do you need to do? I need to take it out. My only my only questions are going to be, you know, do you need to knock me out? Uh, you know, uh, is, you know, is it inpatient, outpatient? Does my insurance cover? What's my copay? I mean, close the cell and, and you call up a dental office. I mean, I could, I, Ryan, we should do this. Oh my God, we should do this. We should sit here and just prank phone call dentist for an entire podcast. And we'll just call my friends so we don't get sued. And I'll sit there and say, <laughs> yeah, hey, I just moved from, uh, Wichita, Kansas to Phoenix, Arizona. My last dentist told me I needed three crowns. Do you do crowns? And they'll say, oh, yes, we do. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice day. And they'll say, have a nice day. And hang up. And it's like, hey, they don't know my name. They don't know my phone number. They don't have a digital phone system because they're investing in all these $100,000 pieces of equipment. I mean, it's just, it's just batshit crazy when you call the front desk because the dentist has eight years of college. The hygienist has four years of college. My, my assistants went through a nine-month, one-year-long program. And these receptionists are picked up off the street. The dentist doesn't train them or educate them for an, a minute. And then when they go to continue education courses, the dentist always saves money by going by themselves. And the 20% of the room where the dentist brings the whole staff, they usually, their tax returns are usually double than all the individuals who come alone because the ones who come alone are all saving money, which I hope they are because they're not making any money. And the richest dentist I ever meet in my life You'll go lecture, and there's like three rows of this monster office, and the doctor doesn't even come. 
I said, well, where's your doctor? Oh, he's golfing. So he's not even coming? And the office manager's like, well, not, no, he's not. I mean, when he comes to work, he just, he just does what we tell him. We say, go in there and do a crown, then go over there and do a hygiene. He just does what we say. And his team's super massively uh, trained, and, and, and that, that's, that's, uh, that's how the game is played. But, hey, Greg, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your life and being on my show today. And uh, thank you for increasing Dennis Close's rates. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to uh, talk to my buddy, Lisa Gonzalez. I will make arrangements for that. Thank you very much. And uh, I trust that uh, you have our website posted up there for dentists to, to contact us. Inofficedentalplans.com. By the way, on a Google search, don't do www.inofficedentalplans.com. What I just do is I'll just like type in like inofficedentalplans.com and there can be spaces between all the words or whatever and Google seems to find that because if you go www. type in a bunch of stuff .com and you have one typo it's a no go. But right. if you just type in in office dental plans and if you're 54 and you can't read your damn iPhone anyway cuz you're half blind <laughs> uh, but there's no www in front of it or just type in the words uh, Google's yeah. damn good at that. So in office dental plans.com can they can they email you? Yes, uh, my email address is uh, Greg Beck, DPS at gmail.com. Very simple. And Greg Beck, what name does that sound like? Who's the guy on Fox News? The uh, uh, Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck. Yeah, uh, that was uh, that was funny when I first saw that. I, I joked that. Uh, I hope they don't think it's Glenn Beck. Uh, I what, what is your phone Glenn number? Time, uh, from time to time, and I hope someday Glenn gets called Greg Beck someday. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what, what's your phone number? My telephone number is 913-851-3039. 913-851-3039. The takeaway from today is start getting a digital phone system. Measure how many incoming calls. How many incoming calls were not already in your computer system? How many incoming calls not in your computer does it take for you to close the cell? How, what is your treatment plan case acceptance? The national average is 38%. That means you're a fireman, and when they tell you there's three fires in town, you're only putting out one. They would fire every fireman in your city if they could only put out one-third of the fires. So then you start measuring, well, how can I get my close rate from one out of three to two out of three? I'm convinced that one out of three Americans wouldn't buy a duck if it laid a golden egg every morning. But mm -hmm. I've seen people go from closing one out of three to two out of three and having an in-office dental plan was a game changer. So it Greg, is. thanks for all that you do for my homies and I hope yes. you have a rocking hot day and uh, you're uh, go Kansas City Royals. Yes, yes, and I do plan on getting down to uh, surprise there to see my, uh, my, my boys in blue. And I promise to stop by your office, okay? I got, I got to tell you one thing about your boys in blue. My mom is a batshit crazy Kansas City Royals fan. <laughs> I, mean, I like she, her already. She emails me, she emails or texts or calls me three times during a game. I mean, the woman, she loves, she loves the Royals and she loves horse racing. Uh, all, the, all the Kentucky Derbies, all the Downs, all that stuff. She just loves that stuff. And she's Catholic, so of course she's addicted to bingo. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, yeah, she loves the Royals. My God, she I lives for the Royals. Stories. Next time I see you, I have a few stories about the the Royals and last year and everything. It, it was it was fun last year living in Kansas City. Well, I was in dental school when they won the last World Series thirty years ago. Eighty five, huh? Yeah, I was in I was in Kansas at UMKC Dental School from eighty four to eighty seven. Right. And I never saw a town turn upside down before when they won that deal. And, and, and then when they just won it just recently, again, the aerial pictures of how many people showed up for that parade was right. stunning. I was at an ADMC conference in Washington, D.C. during the final days of the uh, World Series there and had tickets for game six if it were going to occur and i was ready to leave the conference and go watch my boys but they won it in five and uh 
Uh, but my wife ended up going to the uh, parade, said goodbye, Greg. You know, you go have fun at your conference, but I'm going to watch my boys. Oh, there were there were dental offices on on Dental Town. They were just saying we're you know we just we just came to work and basically the whole answer machines lit up. No no one's coming yeah. in today, <laughs> so they just told their staff, well, no one's coming in anyway, so let's just all go to the parade. Yeah. How many people showed up at the parade? So how that, you, it you was know, great. You know how many people showed up at the parade? I heard eight hundred and fifty thousand. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, the interstates were actually blocked from cars just stopping and parking. Huh. No huh. way in or out. Huh. That is just amazing. And uh, it was just utterly amazing. Crazy. All so. right, buddy. Well, you have a rocking hot day, and I'll see you in St. Joe, Missouri. <laughs> Thanks so much. We'll stay in touch.